Well, welcome everybody. Um, today is an academic half day uh, dedicated to global health. We do this once a year, every year at about this time. Um, and I've been one of the presenters for the last couple of years. So it's, it's nice to see you all here. We always really look forward to this opportunity to um, talk about issues in global health and, um, and also to engage with all of you about issues in global health. Because I think, you know, oftentimes we do a lot of programming in global health um, in the department. And I know there's a lot of interest in global health outside of the pathways and the programs there. So um, this gives us an opportunity to kind of address everyone. Um, today, so I don't, Jason, do you want to go to the next slide so that we can show kind of the agenda? Yeah. Um, so this year's Global Health Academic Half Day, we're going to focus on the topic of ethical issues in global health. Um, this is something we've done before, but not in the last few years. But I do want to just give an apology to anyone who has taken the Leadership in Global Health course, because we do this session um, every year in that course as a, as a session. So if you've taken this, you may have seen some of this stuff before. So apologies if this is repeated for you. Um, but hopefully the conversations that come up around these issues will be, will uncover new territory. Um, I think before we go get into the agenda, I think we would love to see your faces for anybody who wants to put your camera on. I do feel that um, we get more interaction with people if we can actually see each other. Um, so we're going to keep our cameras on and particularly if you are talking, um, we'd love to see your faces while that's happening. All right, I will just read off this. Um, agenda here so that we know what's coming for the day. I think we have about two and a half hours. And the way we've broken that down is um, right now we're doing introductions and agenda. We'll do introductions in a minute. And then from 9, 10 to 10 o'clock, we'll, um, we'll be going through some global health ethics and case studies. So kind of an overview of global, global health ethics and then talking through case studies in a discussion. Um, then you'll have a break. Uh, this says five minutes. We'll see how it goes in terms of timing. You may get more or maybe less, but probably not less. Um, and then ethical considerations of global health work. So this will be another discussion led by Jason Bestie and Alex Alexa Lindley. And then at the end, there will break out into breakout rooms and do a small group case study. So I think that leads us into introductions. Um, Jason, do you, do you wanna? Sure, yeah, I'd love to. I'll... Yeah, thank you. So um, my name is Jason Besty and I'm an infectious disease physician in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease at UW. And um, I do uh, kind of a whole bunch of different things including clinical work, uh, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, and I'm not quite sure if I've been able to meet and work with any of you. Hopefully I have on either the consult service or on the GenMed B service at Harborview. Um, and I also do a lot of teaching and medical education. So I direct the Global Health and Rural Health Fellowship at UW and the Global Health Pathway and the Global Health Immersion Program in the medical school. And I also do some work for ITEC at UW um, doing some global health HIV work with them. Um, with that, what I would like to ask each of you to do is if you could, uh, most of you have your names up in the in your Zoom boxes, but could you put your names and then also just say the, maybe put the year of residency you're in and your pronouns. Um, that would be really helpful too, as we uh, work, as we're spend the next two and a half hours together. Uh, with that, Eliza, I'll pass it off over to you. Thank you. All right, my name is Eliza Monroe Wise. Um, I am an internist and infectious disease physician. I did my residency and fellowship at UW. Um, I have been based in Kenya for the last five years. Um, and I do uh, kind of like Jason, I do a lot of different things. Um, my main kind of areas are um, HIV testing research among key populations here. 
um, and medical education program. So I've been involved in the CEPI program in Naivasha that many of you probably are aware of or have participated in. So I'm a faculty advisor for that um, and some other kind of training and medical education programs here. And most recently, I've also um, become involved in a big public hospital that um, is brand new here in Nairobi. Um, helping with sort of the leadership and vision for that hospital system. So I think that's it for introductions. I see a lot of you are um, putting your names and your, um, yeah, great, your pronouns. That's excellent. So before we just launch into the first um, discussion, I want to just say, um, a lot of what we're doing today is a, a discussion and is meant to be interactive. And, and I know that's challenging over Zoom, but I think um, we all have significant experience now <laughs> working with Zoom. Um, and so hopefully we can make this as interactive as it would be if we were in person. Um, so I do wanna hear from you. And particularly with this first talk, uh, let me share my screen, oops. Um, there's going to be a lot of times where I pause and ask you to contribute, to share whatever it is that you're thinking, um, whether it's in the chat box or, okay, uh, you know, it occurs to me, can I see the chat box while I'm presenting? Liza, it's sometimes challenging to do so. I think that um, Nina would probably be happy to help make sure that the chat box is read while you're going. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Um, actually, I have it here open, but now I'm trying to, okay, let's go back to it. There we go. Okay, I think I can do this. I'm just gonna have to move some boxes around on my screen. Um, great, let's get started. Uh, We'll go to the first slide. I can advance. There we go. Okay, so I wanted to start by just talking about sort of the realms um, of global health ethics. There, when we talk about global health, there's a lot of different things that, that can mean. Um, and to me, there are three big things that come to mind where I think about the ethical implications of our work in global health. Um, and I want to just mention these realms because today, at least for this first talk, I'm going to be, um, oh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to be focusing on one realm. So, <clears throat> The first realm that I wanna talk about is clinical work in global health. Um, so this is people going abroad and engaging in clinical activities in an environment that is foreign to them, generally speaking. And I'll talk in a minute why, um, about why it's important to think about that realm. Um, the second is research in global health. And so that's a lot of what we engage in in the Department of Glo Global Health. And that has its own sort of separate and tricky um, ethical dilemmas and issues that come up. Um, and sometimes these can overlap, um, but oftentimes the issues that come up doing clinical work abroad are different from those that come up when you're doing research. Third is something that I think about a lot in our university, and that is um, climate change and global health. Um, so the Global Health Department at University of Washington is by far the largest burner of fossil fuels of any program or department in the university. Um, and just by the very nature of it being global, um, we end up having a huge carbon footprint. Um, and so what that ends up doing is setting up sort of a um, hypocritical scenario in which we are professing to work to help people's health, but at the same time, what we're doing um, is harming people because of our carbon footprint. So that is a whole separate ethical realm um, that I don't think personally has gotten enough uh, kind of press to date. 
but I know that there are people in the university who are working on it. Um, so I think we'll see more about this in the years to come. So that uh, having said all of that, what we're focusing on, or at least what I'm focusing on for this first hour today is the first one I mentioned. So clinical work in global health. And one of the reasons why I think it's really important to talk about this is that um, the engagement in clinical rotations has increased um, pretty much steadily since like the 1970s. And so this is an old paper now, it was published in 2007, but you can see the steady rise of people who participated in elective international health rotation. And if you project this out, you know, I think we're probably upwards of about 30% um, uh, in the US of medical trainees who go abroad and, and engage in some sort of um, clinical experience. So before we start talking about the difficult scenarios that can come up, I also want to just mention that there's a lot of good that can come out of these international experiences. And so I think it would be wrong if we all walked away from this saying, there's no way to do this in a positive way, um, because there is, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good outcomes that can, that can arise from participating in international experience. Um, so I'm just gonna go through these one by one. So these are the ones that I could think of, but I'd love it if anybody else um, wanted to contribute your own thoughts about positive kind of things that can come out of this. So one is, and also motivations that people have for doing this. So caring for the vulnerable um, in a lot of parts of the world, there isn't enough medical care. So um, I think it's a good idea for people to engage in uh, care for people who can't otherwise access care. Caring for different types of people, I think we all grow as clinicians when we broaden our experience of people that we um, care for. Providing primary care, so um, in a lot of parts of the world, even primary care is hard to access, and so that's something that's relatively low-hanging fruit. Uh, improved diagnostic skills, so practicing in a practice environment that is different from what you're used to. And sometimes when we don't have all of the high-tech tools at our fingertips, we are forced to broaden our idea of how to diagnose um, and, and tune some of your skills. Um, humanitarianism and volunteerism is a motivating factor for a lot of people. Um, and then public health and training. So we can engage in public health programs we can engage in training programs um, and we can, you know, provide additional brain power in those, um, in those programs. So there's a lot of different ways and motivations for people to participate in, in international kind of medical experiences. Okay, so what are the downsides? Uh, First of all, I'd like to invite you all to add anything to that that you might. Um, thanks, Roxanne. It's like you're reading my mind. Another positive challenges stereotypes and builds bridges between you and the global population. Absolutely. Anyone else have any other positives that you'd want to add? Yeah, so two-way exchange. I think you guys are both saying the same thing. Vaccine diplomacy. I'm being told that my internet is unstable. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, being able to compare the global healthcare system to our own. Yeah, so it might actually broaden your idea of what a healthcare system can do and how it can function. Um, so that's a great one. All right. Anybody want to offer some potential downsides? Sharing new evidences and updates, great. I'm assuming that was a positive. <laughs> Finances might be a barrier. Okay, yeah, I think it can be financially difficult for people to travel abroad and live abroad.
changing expectations to the community you serve than maybe not being able to sustain. Yeah, so sustainability is a big issue um, in global health ethics. Voyeurism, undermining more sustainable healthcare solutions. Those are great ones. Um, ethnocentrism or white savior complex, absolutely. And we're gonna get into some of this and um, where the pitfalls can be. Yeah, so the same thing, savior complex, not helpful at all to those you're trying to help. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're driven by ego, um, there's probably gonna be negative consequences. Colonialism, excellent. Um, yeah, so I personally believe that uh, decolonizing global health is um, an oxymoron because global health is in and of itself pretty much a colonial uh, manifestation. So it is very difficult um, when you're working in global health to extricate yourself from that colonial structure that's inbuilt. Um, lack of understanding of local context or local illnesses, care may not be very effective, absolutely. So if you don't know about the illnesses that you're faced with, then how are you going to help? Um, oh boy, I think I'm behind. Not compensating communities for teaching us about global health or diagnostics, right? So if it's a one-sided um, exchange where you, the visitor, are getting everything out of it and there's, no, there's nothing you're giving, um, then obviously that is in, in, unequal. Not compensating, oh, you, uh, sorry, that's the one I read. Environmental footprint, excellent. So we already sort of touched on that at the beginning. Knowing but not practicing standard of care in resource poor countries. Oh, you're ahead of me there. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that. Creating dependence on external support. Yeah, so that kind of goes back to the sustainability issue. Um, not recognizing that the visitor often takes away more than they give to the community. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's move on, but I'm really glad that you're all thinking about this. Um, so just a very, very brief touching base about the basics of ethics before we get into, oh boy, we're already 20 minutes in, before we get into the cases. Um, so, the three, well, depending on who you read, there are <laughs> varying numbers of basic principles in ethics, but the three ones I think about are justice, autonomy, <clears throat> and beneficence slash non-maleficence, okay? Those are sort of like the big umbrella categories, and there's lots of smaller subunits. <clears throat> and so where we can um, kind of get into gray areas or, or um, issues with each one of these. So with justice, um, so the idea is e equality in aid or access to care. So justice and sort of equality are uh, hand, go hand in hand. And so when there's aid or when there's a program or you know, you're providing services, um, you need to ensure that there is justice in what you're doing in that global health program. Autonomy, so I think of two types of autonomy here when we're thinking about global health. Normally, when we talk about ethics, we talk about the autonomy of the patients. But there's a second type of autonomy that I've seen come up in global health work where your presence may challenge the autonomy of the providers that you're working with. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> so you wanna make sure that everybody's autonomy is respected here. <clears throat> and then in terms of beneficence and non-maleficence, um, you have to be thinking about what's best for the patient, obviously. That's, again, sort of how we define this. But I, in global health, we're thinking about things that holistically, what's best for the providers, what's best for the healthcare system. And then another thing I didn't even write here, but what's best for the community. Um, so there's a lot of beneficence and non-maleficence issues that can come up when all of a sudden, you know, we're working in a healthcare system that is foreign to us and a, and a community and a culture that's foreign to us. All right, so those are the basics. And I think Jason's gonna retouch on those later. Let's get into case one, because we don't have that much time. Um, I guess I'm just gonna read this. Normally I have one of you read it. Does, it, does anybody want to volunteer to read this out loud? could just unmute yourself and read it. If, if not, I'll just do it. <laughs> okay, you're all very quiet. 
A 32-year-old general surgery resident named Cindy travels to rural Uganda to work in a district hospital there for one month. There, she works with a medical officer who is assigned to the surgery department of the hospital, and they are under the supervision of the consulting general surgeon and an internal medicine chief resident from the U.S. I wanted to stop briefly and mention that all of the cases that I'm um, presenting today are real things that have happened that um, I've known about in my work in global health. So none of these are made up. The medical officer, Mabel, has no specific training in surgery. So medical officers are people who have graduated from um, medical school, but they haven't done their residency yet. So they work as sort of general practitioners for a few years before they go to residency. Cindy is a fifth year resident in her research time before completing her residency in surgery. One day at about 6 p.m., Cindy gets a call from Mabel. There is a patient in the hospital with a terrible open fracture slash near amputation of a tib fib after he was attacked by a hippopotamus. The leg is not salvageable and needs urgent amputation. Mabel has never performed a below the knee amputation before and has done very few operations on extremities at all. She has tried calling the consulting surgeon many times, but he is not picking up his phone. She has informed the nurse anesthetist who is on her way, and she is currently prepping the patient for surgery. She requests Cindy to come help with the operation. Cindy is troubled by the situation. Although she has scrubbed into several BKAs, she has never led one. She knows that she would not be considered qualified to lead a BKA pr procedure in the United States without supervision. However, she also knows that if she does not help, Mabel is going to do the surgery on her own. Cindy knows that she is better trained in this procedure than Mabel and that the patient would probably do better under her supervision. So the issue here is Cindy feels like she needs to practice um, you know, a, a procedure unsupervised that she wouldn't be doing in the US. Um, so the questions I have for you, first off, what should Cindy do? Anyone have any thoughts about that? And type them into the chat, or if you're feeling bold, you can just unmute yourself. So I'm one of the anesthesiology <laughs> residents. Our number one principle in any sort of situation where you're in over your head is call for help. So what resources does she have? Make sure that they're fully uh, addressing the possibility of calling in the consulting surgeon or any other um, surgery resources, but also potentially even her own resources. Uh, so in this day and age, is there somebody you can get on WhatsApp from your own program um, to help telemed supervise you even? That's a great idea. Yeah. So um, it, it was clear that there was nobody in the hospital um, locally who was going to be able to help um, and it's a great idea to do a telemed. This was a long time ago. Um, and so it wasn't even considered, <laughs> but, um, there were books and the internet, which were, uh, used to refresh, <laughs> refresh the skills, but not somebody actually walking through the steps. Does anybody else? Oh, here we go. Options to transfer the patient to another center where they can, assuming in this center there weren't. Yeah, that's a good thought. Um, the closest hospital was about two hour drive away. Um, and there's no guarantee that the surgery would have been able to be performed there um, any sooner or by anyone more skilled than this hospital. But I, I love the idea of thinking about all the options for how you could not enter into an ethically questionable situation. Anyone else? Tourniquet, splint, transfer. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not a surgeon, but are there ways to stabilize the situation and leave the definitive surgery for later when the consultant can be reached? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a surgeon either. I don't know if we have any surgeons here today, um, but it, I didn't get that sense that this could be postponed. Short of other alternatives, saving the life of the patient should come first. I favor that Cindy do the procedure. Yeah, Cindy felt that way too. Um, so Cindy did end up doing the procedure with Mabel, the two of them leading it together. Um, was there any plan for a situation like this going in? Nope. <laughs> And so that brings up a really good point, which is that, um, you know, in um, clinical global health situations, it is a really good idea to plan for all the eventu eventualities. Unfortunately, in ethics, we often don't even think about them until they have come up. Um, but this is one that I think could have been anticipated and that many other programs like this have anticipated in the past. Um, and have, have had some sort of plan for. So I think that that is a really good point that, you know, nobody should just go to some place in a foreign country and plan to provide care without understanding all of the backup plans before going in. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to think about what, let's, like actually name the ethical considerations that are happening here. And what categories they fall under from those categories that we talked about before. So justice, autonomy, and benefit slash non-maleficence. Since patient is best served by having the most qualified provider do the surgery. Okay, so I think what you're saying is, you know, that if Cindy does participate rather than sitting it out, we think that the patient will do better. Um, so that's beneficence. What does the patient need now exactly? So that's one of the things at play here. Non-maleficence, not working above one skill level. Yep, exactly. Unfortunately, in this case, it's like pitting the beneficence against the non-maleficence um, in that you don't want Cindy um, working above her skill level, but at the same time, doing this procedure is probably gonna be the best outcome for her because Mabel is going to do it if she doesn't. Um, non-maleficence could contribute to further harm by doing the procedure wrong, yeah. Local laws, malpractice, Cindy's mental health if surgery did not go as planned. I love that you're bringing that up. Um, that is a really key thing here as well um, because I think each of these providers have different expectations going into their clinical scenario. Um, so May for Mabel, this is just an everyday occurrence to her. And even though she hasn't done this procedure much before, um, she doesn't feel like she's unqualified to do it in a way. And, and Cindy, even though she has much more um, training in this, she doesn't feel like she's qualified. So you do have to take into consideration what each of them, you know, how each of them is going to perceive and react to being put in this situation. Um, so, you know, just like I mentioned on this slide, we need to also think about what's best for the providers um, and for the system. Um, Okay, so sorry, James said non-maleficence, not having an available on-call surgeon is a system issue, absolutely. Having a foreign general surgery resident sometimes around isn't a sustainable so solution. You're absolutely right. And there have been situations where an American resident shows up and the consultants disappear because now you've got this you know, other doctor around who can do surgeries. Um, and so I think you're calling out a good point in this case where why wasn't the general surgeon answering their phone? Um, is it because Cindy was around? And that's something I can't answer. 
justice. There's clearly an imbalance in access to care. Good point. Um, you know, this, this patient happened to have Cindy around to help, you know, do this procedure, but next week somebody else might have, um, a, a surgical issue where Mabel will have to do it on her own. Autonomy, patient and family are not involved in any of this decision-making. That's a really good point. Ask the patient what they want, absolutely. So both of you are sharing kind of similar things. So share the reality. I can't put myself in their shoes, but I assume they want their best chance at survival, even if that means Cindy helps because attending isn't there. Um, if not, it's their choice, that's right. Non-maleficence also may damage her relationship with the community she is in She is in if surgery goes wrong. I think you mean the relationship between Cindy and the community, um, maybe even the hospital's relationship with the community. Yeah, and we'll explore that a little more in one of the coming cases. Is it worth considering what options would have been available to the patient if these local providers weren't here? What would have happened if she wasn't there? Would she be overall helping or hurting by intervening? Oh, if these non-local providers, yeah. Autonomy, informing and consenting the patient, absolutely. Autonomy, Cindy can't make the decision for Mabel to also not do the surgery. Right, Mabel kind of has to do the surgery. Um, and so Cindy's not in a place to, to be telling Mabel how to practice medicine. Okay. I think that was a really good review of a lot of the issues um, in this case. And just before I move on to the next one, I want you all to know that what actually happened in this case is Cindy scrubbed in with Mabel, they performed the procedure, um, they together, before they did the amputation, they consulted um, several textbooks on how to do it. Um, it was a wonderfully collaborative, um, situation um, and the surgery went well, um, it was successful, um, but post-op care was poor and the patient did end up having a surgical infection um, and having to have revisions of um, the amputation twice again later. So a BKA turned into an AKA and then it turned into an even higher up AKA but the patient survived um, and is still around today. I get reports about him sometimes. All right, does anybody have any last words about this case before we move on to the next one? I really appreciate how much interaction you guys are already um, engaging in here. All right, let's move to the next. Susan and Jeremy are two family medicine residents doing a month rotation um, in a semi-rural area of Tanzania. They are working on the general adult wards. They work under the supervision of Dr. Runo, the consultant internist. So um, in most parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, the consultant is what we would call the attending. I think you all know that. Um, who only rounds on ward patients once per week. Um, and that's how it goes in a, a lot of parts of the world. They have some concerns about Dr. Runo's style of practicing medicine. Um, one day, Jeremy and Susan see a 14-year-old boy with mental status changes, weakness, and unilateral exophthalmitis. They are not sure what the patient's diagnosis might be, so they would like to order some tests. However, when discussing the patient on word rounds, Dr. Runo states triumphantly, I know exactly what this patient has. He believes the patient has thyrotoxicosis. The residents are perplexed. How can he be so sure? Does the diagnosis make sense? What should they do? So first off, from what you know about this patient so far, do you think the diagnosis makes sense? Okay, getting a lot of no's in the text, in the chat box. Yes, I agree. Um, it doesn't seem to make very much sense. So what should they do? 
they're there on major ward rounds and the attending physician is claiming a diagnosis that they disagree with. Respectfully disagree and order a CT head, okay. Any other thoughts? I'm interested to know two things about that comment. One is, in what way would you respectfully disagree? Would you do it on word rounds when there's a whole group of trainees there or would you do it somewhere else or somehow else? Um, and two is, if the consultant continued to disagree with you, would you still order a CT scan? <laughs> if the consultant said, no, they don't need a CT scan, um, would you then do it anyway? Okay, so we have a couple other. I would do my usual, can you help me understand why you are not worried about infection, ICP, et cetera? Is a CT head even available? The answer is, Maybe um, not at the hospital, but if the family can get enough money together, then the patient could go somewhere else to get a CT scan. So it's possible, it's possible. Timing, I would do it in private um, if the patient seems stable enough for a short wait, if unstable in the moment. Okay, agree with Sarah. Can also say my understanding of thyrotoxicosis is X, Y, Z and elaborate why the patient's presentation doesn't fit. Okay. So I think a lot of you feel that a subtle and gentle discussion of um, that diagnosis um, from the perspective of, I'm still a trainee, so you, can you help me to understand might be a good way to go. Specifically agree with Sarah saying, can you help me understand why you think this is? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, one thing that I just want to say about that approach is that it might seem like um, you are just couching it in this language to be gentle, but actually I would suggest that for your own education, it is important for you to understand why the consultant came to this conclusion. So, um, like to me, those words aren't just lip service to wanting to understand, but really actually wanting to understand how medicine is practiced in a place like this and why, um, why a diagnosis like this might be made. All right. So here's what, yeah, so Sarah says, yes, often when I ask this, I learned that I was in fact wrong. Susan and Jeremy decide to confront Dr. Runo on ward rounds. They challenge his diagnosis and provide some other alternatives that they believe could make more clinical sense. Then they make a bet with him in front of everybody. If the patient has suppressed TSH, Dr. Runo wins. If the TSH is normal, they win. What are some ethical situations with this situation? And I've I've put a, a picture here that I found on the internet. This is not one of the UW pictures, but this is very much what major ward rounds looks like in a lot of the hospitals where I've practiced. It is a lot of people gathered around the consultant physician. Um, it's usually a bigger affair than our usual rounds. So what are some of the ethical issues? And again, I want you to refer back to those three categories that we outlined at the beginning. I would not hang it on a normal TSH, okay. <laughs> so perhaps you're bringing up um, that patients are complex and you know one lab result should not be the definitive uh, anything, but what are the bigger sort of ethical issues here? Dehumanization, okay. VA clinic, um, can you expand on that either by unmuting yourself and 
I'd really like to understand um, what you mean. Eliza, one uh, technical issue, the VA clinic doesn't have a microphone in their location. Oh, okay. Yeah. We might have a microphone today. I don't know. Oh, hooray. Oh, yay. Awesome. So there were, there were two things we were uh, talking about with the dehumanization. Um, there's the dehumanization of the patient. And then there's also, um, you know, not understanding or respecting the culture that this physician has to deal with over the course of his career once you leave. So in the case of the patient, you're making a game out of someone's life and their mental status and you know like everything that is ever going to happen in the rest of their life. Um, and you know perhaps these two individuals are well versed in the culture of the institution and this is how things done. But um, I'm assuming that's not the case. Just that's not the case how this this looks um so you know this would this would come across as just tremendously callous um it disrespects the patient's uh autonomy like this is <laughs> this is violating just about every every part of medical ethics that i can think of in our system um and then also like you have a consulting physician here who is going to have to be here and practice with these other providers and with the patients and community for the rest of his career and you are there for one month and you are going to try to make him look like a fool undermine the community's confidence in him undermine the other employees confidence in him and then also establish an adversarial relationship between whatever program you're there on and whatever program they are so none of this benefits the patient all of this is undermining not just the relationship with the patient in front of you right now, but with every single other person who comes into this hospital later on. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, I think that you touched on all of the major points here. Um, dehumanizing the patient, um, turning their medical situation into a game, um, but also undermining the respect of the consultant physician and um, undermining the really like the future of this program potentially because um, of this kind of adversarial relationship that you are setting the stage for. Um, yeah, I'm just reading through the other comments. Um, yeah, I can damage the relationship between residents and the consultant um, and the reputation of the consultant. And so we're talking about like the future of this hospital and of this program. Um, and somebody mentioned a colonial like culture. Yeah, so this is a really good example of colonialism in global health work. Um, justice, recognize they are able to step out of the traditional medical hierarchy in this way because of their status as foreign visitors. So yeah, they get, some special status because they're visiting from abroad. Um, and so that's a justice issue. Not particularly beneficent. The team is incentivized to find the diagnosis to win a bet rather than finding a diagnosis to do what is right for the patient. Yeah, avoiding delays in diagnosis, disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Good, I think that we touched on all of the main issues here. Um, but unfortunately, we're not done with this case. So let's move on. The patient needs a TSH. Um, so Susan and Jeremy also believe he needs a head CT. However, the patient's family cannot pay for either of these things. Susan and Jeremy have an idea. They will put their own money together and pay for the patient's head CT and TSH. They also want to start a small fund to help pay for other patients' care in the future. They think that rotating American residents should be able to choose the interesting cases and pay for care with the fund that they put together. So now what are the ethical implications of this idea and is there a way to do it in an ethical way? <laughs> John, uh, yes. Shaking heads. <laughs> Justice, exactly. Not fair that outsiders are deciding who gets care. 
paying for interesting cases makes me queasy. What a huge justice issue. Yeah. Okay. So is there a way to do this in an ethical way? Is there a way for the visiting residents to help patients who need care and can't afford it? Interesting cases will benefit, not necessarily those in need. Beneficence, does this help individual patients get better care? Oh, beneficence, because it does help this individual patient get better care. Yeah, so again, pitting two ethical principles against each other. So justice in this case, where, whereby we're saying, well, we shouldn't get to choose who gets extra help and who doesn't, but beneficence on the other side where this one patient would actually benefit from being able to undergo these procedures and lab tests. Um, can't cherry pick who gets care. Sarah says, I suppose you could argue that interesting means challenging and therefore more likely to need diagnostic workup, making them more likely to be unable to get care due to lack of funds. Yeah, maybe. I'll say in this hospital, there's a lot of advanced HIV. Um, and so those patients often got forgot about, forgotten about, but they're complicated and um, needy. Cringe sustainability of fund. Okay, so bringing up the sustainability issue as well, um, but certainly not how I would want to frame this. All right, so nobody um, has mentioned any possible ways to do this in an ethical way. Um, the idea doesn't seem particularly sustainable and makes these hospital dependent on outside trainees. Justice, put decision-making in hands of hospital administration or local committee to distribute donations how they see fit. Yeah, that's, that's what I was kind of thinking is one way that maybe it could work, um, but certainly not the outside providers deciding who gets what. All right, we only have 10 minutes left. I think the extreme personal bias involved in a system where the residents distribute funds as they like would just be very corrosive to trust. Yeah. Um, sorry, before we get into this one, let's read these last couple of comments. Yeah, I suppose you could set it up similar to how transplant committees, et cetera, are a less biased decision maker, exactly. So they would have to be in the hands of um, people who are actually from the community. Perhaps you could use some money for improved infrastructure based on what hospital prioritizes. It could work if the program donates some money with future fundraising to help with sustainability. Yeah, so I think a lot of you are bringing up the sustainability piece of this. So even if we put decision-making in the hands of the hospital or, or the community um, about who you know, benefits from these funds, there's still the issue of sustainability. And so um, you would not want to enter into something that might only last for a year or six months or two years and then just dry up um, because you would worry that there that you know the hospital would start to rely on that um, funding stream. And then again, we'd be faced with a justice issue where some people got to use the funds while they lasted, and then there's no funds anymore. Um, I hate that we're asking trainees to pay something too. Yeah. Transplant is super biased. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it turns out that every healthcare system um, has to grapple with justice issues, every single one. Um, so all of the healthcare systems that we work in face these issues too. But this is just a much more stark and um, ethically challenged example of that. Um, the same thing happens for access to certain medications in the US all the time, yes. And transplant requires a huge amount of personnel to implement. All right, if there are any last comments about this case. Okay, we will move on to case three. Brett, a family medicine resident doing a rotation in Kenya over here's a conversation. Um, oh, sorry, what happened to these residents? Any consequences? Sadly, no. They finished their rotation and left. Um, yeah, there weren't any consequence 
consequence, any consequences. Um, I'm trying to remember what happened with the patient though. Um, I think the TSH was normal. So they won their bet. They did pay for the patient to get a head CT and there was some intracranial abnormality that I now cannot remember. Um, so yeah, the patient was pretty sick. Okay, moving on, sorry, to case three now. So family medicine resident doing a rotation in Kenya um, overhears a conversation with his OBGYN team that he's been working with. The hospital has been hosting a surgery camp where a group of American doctors have come to provide surgeries to people in need for free. One of these surgeons has mistakenly performed a hysterectomy on a patient who was supposed to be undergo undergoing a fibroidectomy in order to improve her chances of conceiving. So young patient, wanted to have kids, had fibroids, was supposed to undergo fibroidectomy, underwent hysterectomy instead at the hands of an American OBGYN. Um, Brett is shocked to hear of this and asks what exactly happened. Brett finds that a number of things have happened as a result of the surgery camp. So for one thing, the hospital usually performed about 100 gynecologic surgeries in a year. Now in the two week surgery camp, they would be performing 50 such cases. Normally consultant physician, physicians, OBGYNs, reviewed patient um, folders themselves and created their own o OR list. So they would go through their patient's charts and generate a list of those that needed surgery. Because so many surgeries were planned, they had a clerk review the charts and make the lists instead of doing it themselves. The patient was supposed to get a fibroidectomy, but in her chart, it said emergency hysterectomy may be necessary. The clerk just, clerk, sorry, just wrote down hysterectomy. The surgeon, the American surgeon, did not check in with the, the patient prior to the surgery and just performed what was written on the operating list. So I want, to I want us all to think about this case and think about how many systems had to fail in order for this disaster to have occurred. So to me, it's like the perfect storm or like a, an airplane crash where it's never just one thing that went wrong. It's a whole group of things that went wrong all together that created this disastrous outcome. Um, so try to think about all the issues that created the perfect storm scenario resulting in this patient's hysterectomy. So someone already wrote, um, sounds like no surgical timeout happened. That's correct, Sarah. Um, and so what's the sort of systems level issue that you see with that? Justice, what is the standard of care? There are many QI measures in the US, less, likely less abroad, but tough to know if this violated the standard of care for this patient. Swiss cheese, Lynette. <laughs> you may need to clarify what you mean by that. There's just so many holes that it's hard to pinpoint where they all are. Yeah, hi guys. We talk about this a lot in my program in emergency medicine about the Swiss cheese model. Like we have all these checks to make sure that all those holes don't line up. And so if something gets through the first three holes, it will be caught at the fourth. So that's right. how we talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, so, but what I'm trying to do is let's talk about each one of those holes. So we have that the surgeon, the, there's no surgical timeout. And I think what you mean by that is there's a standard of care. And the second person who, who said something here also kind of alluded to this. Mm -hmm. There's a standard of care that surgeons practice at in the US and it doesn't seem like they held themselves to that same standard of care when they were operating in another setting. So that's one hole. I wonder about hierarchy. Perhaps the staff felt unable to challenge the foreign surgeons. Yeah, probably. Maybe somebody noticed that something was off here, but nobody said anything. They downgraded standard of care given increased number of cases. Local surgeons did not personally review cases as they would have. Exactly. So 
Um, I don't know that I would say they downgraded standard of care, but they operated outside of their normal procedures because stress was put on that system. And so they, you know, they, they're asking people to do things that they don't normally do and were not trained to do. Um, having clerk review charts rather than surgeons, exactly. Um, transcription error by clerk, possibly related to time constraint of performing 50 surgeries in two weeks, exactly. So the stress put on their systems um, created errors. Non-medical personnel doing surgical planning, right? So, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think this come that brings to light is that there are so many different cadres of people who work in a healthcare system. Um, and we often only think about the doctors when we engage in care, but our presence affects so many other people. It affects the nurses, it affects the clerks, it affects the pharmacists and whoever else is involved um, with something like this. And I think when people plan a surgery camp, they don't think about all those other people who might be involved. Pre-surgical evaluation, yeah, so that didn't happen. Um, language barrier, exactly. So not just the pre-surgical um, checklist, but you know, most surgeons would check in with their patient beforehand and um, meet them. In fact, in a lot of places, they won't do the surgery if they don't talk to them beforehand. And that may have been just because of practicing in a foreign environment, or maybe there was a language barrier. Um, I also wonder about the language barrier, yeah, playing a role. Sometimes even in the US, we avoid conversations if we don't have an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Maybe miscommunication about who was responsible for these safety checks, performing surgeon or referring hospital. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, maybe these roles just weren't fleshed out before the surgery camp happened. Going back to our first case on planning and thinking about all of the plan B scenarios and plan C scenarios that might need to be considered before you enter into um, something like this. Is this a systems issue? Oh my gosh, I'm way behind in these messages. Um, sorry. In the US, um, under consent, we often write a whole list of possible outcomes, including emergency hysterectomy. If this is not routinely done in the other country, maybe the clerk didn't realize that was not an intended procedure. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I do think that's a systems issue because you have, you're have you asking someone to do something without all the knowledge that it, that is required. Maybe the surgeon did speak to the patient and the patient didn't quite understand the subtle linguistic difference between fibroid removal and uterine removal. That's a really good point too. Um, I don't know if that's true if in this case, but I don't think it was true. I don't think the surgeon spoke to the, the patient beforehand. Okay, um, I think I got all the comments here. All right, so now the next question, um, shoot, my watch just died. I think, oh, we're at time. So let's just let's get through this quickly. So what should be done now and how should Brett proceed? So he's, he wasn't even involved in any of this. He just found out about it after the fact. But now he knows. Anyone want to call something out? What should Brett do? Escalate, not sure to whom. Good. I'm not sure he should do anything. <laughs> he only knows what he heard from rumor. Okay. Good point. Yeah. I mean, he's not directly involved, but he, I think he feels at this point, like he should do something. Make sure there was disclosure. Sorry, go ahead. If he's able to identify the ob provider, uh, talk to that provider, both from a perspective of sympathetic listening, because this provider may be aware of the issue and be having a lot of personal distress over it, um, and try to be a sort of listening resource and help problem solve with that provider. Who are they going to escalate it to? Um, but also, are they even aware that this happened? Is this something where the provider who didn't talk to the patient pre-op also didn't talk to the patient post-op um, and is just kind of getting talked about behind their backs by national staff 
um, and really does need to be part of this conversation. So looping in the person who's directly involved. Yeah. And I would say there's at least two people who are directly involved here. So there's the surgeon who performed the surgery, the American surgeon. And then there's also the OBGYN at the hospital who saw the patient before the surgery um, and who presumably has more of a relationship with the patient. Um, so that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of com communication needs to result from this, both with, with both of those OBGYN providers. Okay, and I think there's a few of you saying, like, he kind of needs more information. Was there a disclosure? What happened? Um, does the patient know? So let's move on. So Brett learns that the American doctor who performed the surgery is out on safari and is not planning to come back to the hospital before he leaves the country. Several days later, he learns that the consultant OBGYN is planning on telling the patient that the hysterectomy was an emergency procedure that was necessary to control bleeding. So I should mention that at this point, the patient knows that what happened to her was a hysterectomy and not a fibroidectomy, but she hasn't been told why that happened. And so what Brett learns is that the, the hospital's OBGYN, not the American one, is planning on telling the patient that it was an emergency um, done to control bleeding and that it wasn't planned, which is what we all know actually happened. So in one minute, <laughs> can you just, let's just talk about what the ethical issues are with that, with the idea of telling the patient that it was um, an emergency procedure necessary to save her life. Anyone? All right, maybe we're getting tired. Violates autonomy, yeah. Major violation of patient's autonomy. Yeah, I would agree with that. If, if you don't know what has happened to you, then you don't have the autonomy to do anything about it. Um, so that is it for the last case. Um, I will wrap it up by telling you um, what happened with this patient. Um, so it sounds like there needs to be a conversation slash QI with the surgery camp, exactly, program if this is a repeating annual event. In this hospital, are things normally disclosed to patients? That's a really good question. Um, and, you know, I think to me, this case is not so clear cut. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not sure, honestly, that it was wrong to tell the patient what they told her. Um, in the US, it absolutely would be because we value autonomy and um, you know whatever recourse we have after medical errors are made greatly. But in other cultures, um, that may not be true. And so while I agree with you all that this is a violation of the patient's autonomy, um, some, some part of me still questions whether it would be better for her to know or to not know, honestly. Um, can Brett talk to whoever is his mentor advisor for this experience who hopefully is involved in this clinical collaboration and there can be a higher level conversation between partners? Yeah, major medical error, attempts to preserve trust in providers, but the secret coming out could be a much larger breakdown of trust. That's absolutely true too. Um, I'm trying to imagine what effect emergency hysterectomy versus mistake may have on this patient's self-image and status in the community. Exactly. I mean, these are all things that we have to take into consideration and that we will never understand because we're not from that community. So um, whether people think that she almost died and so they saved her life um, and that helps the community trust the healthcare facility and maybe it's better for her um, 
to both think of herself that way and for the community to think of her that way, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's problematic when we bring our American values to a situation like this um, because the, they're not the same values that are shared by the community. <sighs> okay. So as far as I know, this patient still believes that her hysterectomy was an emergency. The um, surgeon from the surgical camp is aware of what the mistake was, but um, as far as I know, never returned to the hospital and never saw the patient again. And there were no major QI programs as a result of this, sadly, as far as I know, although uh, we, we, our program was not involved in that surgery camp. So I'm not sure whether there was some internal QI process that they underwent after that, but not at the hospital level, sadly. All right, um, the last slide is just, you know, to think about the, the guiding principles um, of global health um, ethics when you go into a situation like this. And again, you know, when you are entering into a foreign place, you need to think about all of those different ethical um, kind of principles but also in terms, not just of the patient, but of the group or program that you're working with, the healthcare system. And again, I, I need to add the community to this slide because that's also really important. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'm way over and it's time for you to have a break. Great. Well, thanks. Yeah, Eliza, that was fantastic. Let's do a five minute break uh, and we'll come back. Let's say we'll come back at 10 15 um, and we'll get started with the second lecture. And if anybody has any other thoughts or comments or wants, has questions, just reach out to me, please. Um, I would love to hear from you. <laughs> 